Welcome to Power Up, the uptime podcast focused on the new hot off the press technology that can change the world. Follow along with me, Alan Hall, and Itosaurus Phil Totaro as we discuss the weird, the wild, and the game-changing ideas that will charge your energy future. Phil, another busy week in the ID and patent world, and we're going to start off with the single point mooring wind turbine with two wind energy conversion units. That's a complicated name for something that seems rather simple from Aerodyne Consulting over in Singapore. And this idea has been implemented by Min Yang. And we've seen this, I think it's called Ocean X, where they have two independent turbines on a platform and a master controller for the two. And it's floating and it points itself on a single mooring system. But there's more details to that. You want to explain what else they have going on in this idea? Yeah, so this this is a, a pretty complicated and but clever idea, um, and I, I actually want to take a step back and talk about the fact that you know nobody else in the industry at this point is using this technology other than Ming Yang, who's licensed the design from from Aerodin. Uh, and and again, what this does is it's going to ensure that. Um, basically the, the platform that has these two, um, counter rotating, uh, turbines on it doesn't basically kind of yaw itself or shake itself apart from, from, um, you know, having the, uh, having the both rotors pointed in, in directions that they shouldn't be pointed in. Uh, so the mooring system's kind of helping with, um, with that to an extent. Um, but it's also ensuring that the entire platform is able to yaw into uh into the wind um in a way that's going to be favorable including um the typhoon that this thing actually just survived over in china uh so uh, when they deployed this prototype it's you know in a typhoon prone area um and you know it seems like this uh single mooring system did its job uh pretty well yeah, the single point mooring is not a new concept, right? It's just a, with this patent, it's filed with the addition of the twin rotor and how that thing works together. But single point mooring has been used offshore in oil and gas world for a very long time. Uh, there's a there's a type of vessel called an FPSO. It's a floating production and storage and offloading facility. But these things are massive. If you've ever seen an offshore, what they, it looks like an offshore oil rig. They look like a big ship, but usually they aren't powered or anything. They're drug out there by tugs, and they're hooked up to what is called the single point mooring system. And that single point mooring system is a way of uh, affixing that structure topside to one spot, and then it can rotate around it uh, in production. And one of the downfalls of this, this setup for operations and maintenance is not so much with this Ming Yang machine, because it's a 16 megawatt machine. It's a big, big thing. But if you have to put a lot of these out there, a single point more needs to be uh, anchored off in usually the four cardinal directions. Sometimes they do six. So you end up with a lot of lines and a lot of anchors coming off of this single point more. So there's a lot of work to be done to get these things out into position because you have to do geotechnical investigations where all the anchors go and these kind of things. A lot of anchor lines, chain lines to get them to get them in place. Now, that being said, these processes have been done many times in the offshore world. So the knowledge of how to install a single point mooring system is there. It's pretty common. You're not reinventing the wheel to get this done. And they're robust. That's one of the reasons they use them for these massive SPF, SP, FPSOs. They can be 1,300 feet long, those ships can, and weigh hundreds of tons. So it proved itself in the typhoon that just came through uh, in that part of the world. And I think that it's a good design. It's a robust design, and you're not going to be reinventing the wheel to get it uh, installed offshore. You know, at this point, Ming Yang, as I mentioned, is the only company that's utilizing this. So this patent is kind of a purely defensive thing for them, just protecting their little corner of the world. Um, but the fact that this technology has proven itself to be kind of typhoon resistant, so to speak, um, this could encourage uh, more companies to go uh, talk to Aridin about uh, licensing this technology and utilizing it in, in other markets where, you know, floating platforms um, are, are likely to become more prevalent, including places like uh, South Korea and uh, potentially even Brazil. 
One of the dreams in the blade world is to be able to make modular blade sections that allow you to make sorter sections, transport them, and maybe even assemble them on site. Well, this next idea comes from the New Tech Group over in China for a cord-wise segment connection structure for wind turbine blades. And uh, to simplify this a little bit, they, they're building the blade in roughly three sections, a leading edge, a trailing edge, and then a sort of a box section in the middle. But Phil, the key to this idea is how they're attaching all the pieces together. Yeah, and, and it's kind of interesting, and I, I made the comment off air that this seems very similar to how you already kind of bond and attach a, a shear clip. Um, for those that aren't familiar, this is basically a, a part of the blade um, that goes into what we call the shear web. So it's a structural beam, um, usually towards the, the back end of, of the blade and the, the trailing edge of the blade, um, away from you know, the, the, what Alan just mentioned, the, the box beam section, uh, or your, your either single or dual uh, vertical spars and vertical supports. So the, the interesting thing about this is it's, it's maybe kind of combining a couple ideas. And while that usually doesn't sound very exciting to, you know, engineers or even, you know, uh, patent office uh, reviewers, what they are able to do with concepts like this where you're combining kind of pre-existing technologies is say and explain that, hey, we're doing something in a new way. Um, and that's still valid and viable to be able to go get a patent on. Um, whether or not this technology is going to revolutionize the market, we'll see. The one thing I can say though is in China, the reason that they've probably developed this is because you're now seeing blades that are at a minimum about 85 meters in length, just the blade. Um, and some of these rotors for onshore turbines are now going up to like, you know, call it 230 meters uh, rotor diameter. So they're, you know, you like I said, you're talking about blades that are anywhere from 85 up to, you know, potentially um, 120 <laughs> meters in, in length. Um, and you're, you're going to need, you know, new technologies and new ways of assembly, uh, potentially to, to be able to address that, uh, uh, those kind of logistical challenges. So what this aims to do is solve some of the structural issues and the sealing up of these blades, um, in a modularized fashion, if you can build them on site, um, the validity of it and the reality of it is, is what, what I've heard and what we've seen on root cause analysis studies and stuff for modularized blades right now is technology is just not quite ready. So maybe this can get uh, some of these projects down the road and over some of the hurdles that we have and uh, make that a reality. And, and that's a good point, Joel, because a lot of what we've seen for modular blades in the past was, was you know, bolted joint connections that it tends not to work that well. Uh, you get fatigue failure and other things that, that happen. This is literally a, a means for, um, you know, assembling a, a modular blade, uh, utilizing, again, kind of the same type of bonding methods that you would use in a factory-controlled environment. It's just whether or not you can have that same level of quality control out in the field when you're trying to put together these little bonded sections of, of blades. And our last idea of the week is a really useful device to keep your ears from falling into your food. Now, most people don't have that problem, but your four-legged friends probably do, particularly if you're a poodle, that when you reach down into your bowl to eat your dinner, your ears flop around into your food. So this device rolls over the poodle's ears and wraps around the back of its head to keep its ears up and away from the dinner bowl. Now, Phil, come on. This is a really good idea. There's a lot of poodles with this problem. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I, I'm going to agree. It's a useful idea. And I'm here to tell you, if you try to put this on, on my dog, Yogi, at dinner time, you're going to lose a finger. This is not going to happen. <laughs> this is not going to happen while there's food ready in the bowl. She's not going to go down with it. You're going to have to just let it go and use a rag to clean off the ears, or in her case, her chin beard. Which is, you know what, Joel? That may be another patent for another day. 